fearing shibori dyeing was because I'm a fiber artist and I love to do embroidery primarily, but I found that it took forever for me to get the, uh, the space filled in with lots of embroidery stitches. So that's when I learned how to do some more surface design techniques. I wanted to get some pattern and texture and image, something to respond to on the fabric before I started working with my embroidery skills. And I fell in love with Shibori while I was at grad school at Tyler. They have an amazing fiber arts program there, an amazing studio for dyeing. And so I'm, I'm doing my best right here. This is the first time I've dyed in my little studio where I usually do my sewing and where I do my online teaching. So I'm a little nervous about the dye and the carpet, but we'll, we'll work it out. I have prepared my space with some plastic to cover my area. So if you are dying in a place that you don't normally work in, you just wanna protect everything. I've gathered up all of my materials, both the things that I need to create the folds and the fabric and prepare the fabric for dyeing. And also I've prepared my dye and I've got plenty of water with me and some jars, my gloves and so forth. So I want to first talk about supplies. So this is a screen that, um, hang on, you might want to screenshot or photograph while it's up. So let me get that up for you. There we go. There's one of my lovely students from one of the, the Shibori dyeing classes we did at Fleischer. I just pop in to feel like we're at Fleischer. And here are supplies that you would need. The, because I'm using Proshan MX dye, which is a fiber reactive dye, you want to use a natural fabric. So natural materials like cotton, silk, and linen. Um, you can get yarded or clothing blanks in white or light colors to dye on. Maybe you have a piece of white clothing that you would like to change colors, or maybe you'd like to create some yardage that you'll use in other kinds of projects. Whenever you're using dye, you definitely want to have some rubber gloves so that you don't end up looking like a smurf. You can use rubber bands for some of the binding techniques, or you can use thread. I like to use a uh, crochet cotton thread because it's nice and strong, it doesn't snap easily on me, and um, it's a color so I can see where it is in contrast to my fabric. It, for some of the techniques, you may want to use flat shapes of wood, plastic, or metal, and some spring clamps to add pressure. For some techniques, you may want to have needle and thread. For dyeing, you would need a non-food container, so you use it for dye, you're never going to eat from it again. And I use Proshan MX dye, which is a fiber reactive dye, as I said. To activate the Proshan MX dye, you need a soda ash, and you'll need some non-food utensils for measuring and mixing. If you're here in Philadelphia with us, you might want to visit Jomar Fabrics and Gaffney Fabrics uh, and Joanne Fabrics for um, some fabric resources. And most dyeing materials are available at craft stores like Michael's. And my favorite place online to get fabric blanks and dyeing materials is dharmatrading.com. They're in California, so depending on where you are, shipping might take a little long. So, question for you. Yes. Um, the dye that you're using tonight, will it be natural or are there safety precautions to take? It is a synthetic dye. Um, it is not, and I'm not using natural dyes, they are synthetic. Um, fiber reactive dyes are chemical, and so the precautions I'm taking are wearing gloves, covering my space with plastic so that if I spill any, um, I can clean it up easily and it won't soak into my workspace that I use regularly. And when I measure things out, it is good to have um, a face mask on so that you don't inhale any of the particles. That's what I forgot to grab, <laughs> but I pre-mixed my dye. Great question. So I want to go through some of the folding techniques for each of the styles of shibori that we could try out. And shibori is what we might commonly know as tie-dye, and it means to compress something. So you need pressure or compression to resist 
the dye to reserve some areas of your fabric as whatever your fabric color is, and then allow some areas to get dye soaked into them. So depending on how you fold, roll, tie, bind, compress your fabric, you're going to get some very different effects. I wanted to start with the Kumo and Kanoko Shibori styles because they're probably the ones that are the most familiar to people and they're really the easiest ones to do. So Kumo is when this one that looks sort of like a spider web and Kanoko is the one that looks like little circles. So to do it, you're going to pluck damp fabric wherever you want a circle and then you can bind it off with rubber band thread in a narrow section to create the kanoko or <laughs> use winding and knotting of the pluck for the spider web look. Uh oh I wanted to like stop and do each one as we go. Oh am I highlighted now? Is my workspace highlighted? Yes. Awesome. All right so um, you're usually going to work with damp fabric um, for the demonstration purpose tonight, I'm just going to do it dry for now, but before I dye it, I'll dampen it. You can use um, like marbles and inserts and beads and things to create a regular kind of mark, um, or you can just do random ones. I have some crochet thread here that I'm going to use for the binding instead of rubber bands. And wherever you want a, a circle, you just pluck and kind of stroke down the fabric so you have this little top section. I'm going to lay my thread over that plucked area and then bind around. And just by crossing over that tail, it'll trap it and it'll be secure. So depending on how far you pluck into that section, like what the radius is of that section, that will determine the size of the circle. So if I wanted a big circle, I would bring the radius a little farther in. And if I want a small circle, you do it near the tip. You can also change the width of the circle that you create just by making that winding a little bit wider or deeper. If you're doing a lot of them, you can just leave it on there and pluck another spot and then hop over and travel to the next one. And because I've tied so tightly and pulled so tightly, it doesn't really unravel. However, if you're concerned, you can snip it off and just send your tail through the loop there. Now I would have a little tiny circle right in that spot. I wanna make a larger one too and try, so that's Kumo. I wanna try the, no, that's Kanoko. I wanna try the Kumo. So I wanna make a larger circle this time. So I'm gonna pluck near the center, I'm gonna stroke down to get a radius. And this time, I'm gonna start farther away and bind very tightly near the bottom. Oh, it was strong and then it snapped on me. Always in a demo. Okay, and for the spider web, you can either wind up like this, or you can create knots. I need a little more thread. And kind of twist, almost like you're casting on, twist around a knot, and then pull it tight. Twist around. And make sure your twists land up the loop here. Pluck, that's what I meant. Marie, can you use a uh, rip die? Absolutely. Just follow whatever the instructions are on the dies that you're using. Like if you were using silk or wool, you could use acid dies. Rip dies fine. Can you tell us a little bit about the cultural history of Shibori and the processes that um, you're using? Or techniques, I should say? Yeah, the, um, the ones that I'm naming here are all Japanese. So the word Shibori 
the kumo, kanoko, those are all Japanese terms. And there's a strong culture of shibori dyeing, especially in Kyoto, Japan, which I wish I could visit someday. However, dye dye techniques exist all over the world and have emerged from countries and cultures all over the world. Um, it's one of the earliest kinds of dyeing techniques to get patterned onto fabric that exists throughout the world. So at this time, I've got a small kanoko pluck, and I have this kumo, mixing them up, I'm sorry. <laughs> kumo is the little guys, short word, kumo, kumo little pluck, and I've got this longer kanoko kind of spider web look. So I've bound very tightly. You, that's the most important part, making sure that the bindings are very tightly wound. So, and they're all knotted off, and that's ready to put in the dye pot. One other one that is not necessarily Kumo or Kanoko, but is very often used in t-shirt dyeing, and which has a similar idea of having a pluck and binding with either rubber bands or fabric or thread. And that is to create a spiral. So to do a spiral, you leave your fabric flat on your table. You're going to pinch, and that creates a little fold in the fabric. And then you're going to spin your pinch until all the fabric starts to create this sort of rosebud of petals around it. And spin. And spin until it's all as tight as you can get it. Now this is a very small little bundle. If you were doing a t-shirt, you'd end up with a much larger bundle. This is a little easier to do with rubber bands because you can rubber band a little asterisk around it, but you can still do it with some thread. So I'm just going to wind down some thread and trap it in one direction. Then I'm gonna twist it and try to get a different direction to get that spiraling, or sort of like a, a peppermint candy kind of effect. Okay, and I want to secure that with a little knot. Is that too short? Okay. So nice little bundle there, nice and tight. And if I dye the whole thing, uh, it'll be a little more saturated. If I dye only half of this, I would really get that peppermint candy kind of swirl. So this is ready for the dye pot. So those are two kinds you, of techniques. I'm sorry, what do you mean by dye half of it versus dye the whole thing? So like, you, you can control how much you dip. Like say I only wanted part of my fabric to be dyed and I didn't want the rest. I could dip part of it into the dye and leave the rest unexposed. So you get different effects depending on how much of your fabric you dip into the dye. So this, if the whole thing went in, it would get more saturated with color and there'd be less white space left over. This particular one that looks sort of like a rosebud or cinnamon roll kind of spiral, if you only dip half of it, you get a more pronounced pinwheel effect on the, the spiral. Um, those are two binding techniques you can use with thread or rubber bands. The next one I want to show is itadime shibori. This is where you have folding techniques and depending on how you fold and the shape you use to clamp the fabric, they'll get different kinds of patterns. So the one on the top right, I can tell that they did an accordion fold in two directions. The one on the bottom right, I can tell they did a triangular fold. And the one on the left, it looks like it, I think that one was dyed with, with two, like two separate times. Like they did the yellow first where more fabric was exposed and then they washed it out, let it dry, redid it and then exposed it with, uh, refolded and clamped it and then did the blue. So you can get multicolored effects on the fabric either at one time by using different colors or by dyeing 
and then washing out and then re-dyeing. Um, so for this, you're gonna fold fabric in an accordion fabric pattern, either rectangularly or triangularly. And then you need some plastic or wooden shapes to sandwich the folded bundle. This also, this creates a way of more pressure being applied to it. It helps distribute pressure. And it also protects some of the fabric from exposure from the dye. You can either clamp together with a spring clamp, or if you don't have those, you can use rubber bands or twine, but it might be a looser compression. So I want to show you some different folds. And I've got some clamps and shapes here. The fabric, again, you want to start damp. And I think this time I am going to start damp because um, if you don't, the, the dryness of the fabric, especially when something is deeply compressed or very folded, can actually act as a resist too. It's like when you put in the, um, the put it in the dye, even like the dryness can resist the dye. So I am gonna dampen this one. I've got a bucket of water near me. And then just squeeze it out. Okay, I've got some damp fabric. Damp fabric is also going to hold folds more tightly. So this one I'm gonna do rectangular. So if you fold in and in and in, the first end that got folded in is not going to receive as much dye. So you can create an ombre effect by rolling the fabric. If you wanna have more distributed color throughout your piece, you wanna do an accordion fold. So back and forth and back and forth. And again, this damp fabric, when I kind of press it down with my fabrics, it's helping to hold the crispness of the folds be a little more precise. Now, one option is this is in one direction. I could put several different clamps down here. If you're working at home, things like paper clips, alligator clips, um, so forth, you can use those because they'll compress the fabric. You don't need fancy things like my spring clamps and shapes. Anything that's going to put pressure on that is going to create an interesting mark. I only have a really small piece of fabric here, though. The bigger the bundle, the more resistance I'm going to get on my spring. So I'm also going to fold in the opposite direction. And this is going to create a sort of uh, grid pattern. So back and forth and back and forth. And doing the accordion in both directions is going to more evenly distribute the color. So I have... You know, I don't know how much of a mark this is going to make because my folds are just a tiny bit smaller than this shape. But whatever shape you put on here, you're going to capture, at least on the first layer, a resist that matches that shape. As you go through the folds, it sort of starts to fade away and get more simplified. But you can have two matching shapes on either side. Try to line up their edges so that they're symmetrical. And then just use a spring clamp like this and try to center it so that it evenly distributes the pressure. And now that's ready for the die pack. The second kind, instead of a rectangular, would be to do a triangle pattern. So again, I'm laying my fabric. This one, I wanna start with a rectangular fold. So I think I'll do that the long ways. Oh, there was some dye on my plastic. I just picked up some color. And for the triangular fold, it's sort of like folding a flag. You're gonna start folding over the triangle. We also wanna accordion this fold. So instead of folding in, I'm gonna fold back. Fold diagonal. Fold back. Diagonal and back. So this one is going to create more of that 
um, kind of star or hexagon kind of pattern. And I have these, these are fun because they've got voids in them. So they will let a little bit of color through those spots as well. And the edges that are exposed are gonna get dyed more than anything else. That should create an interesting pattern. And again, I'm going to clamp it. If you didn't have clamps, I could just like sandwich this and then try to tightly bind it with thread or rubber bands. Marie, where do you get your handy objects that you're using? So there is a wonderful store in Philadelphia for those who are close by called Everything Plastic. I do think they ship. So um, they have um, a plastic shape bar and it's just filled with all these little doodads of shapes. Um, I do prefer using plastic for this because the dye will wash off and I can reuse them without, um, without contaminating my next dye project. I have also successfully used wooden shapes that you can get at craft stores. And those, there's all kinds of things. Like if you have a laser cutter or access to one, you can make an Itajime block lamp uh, in any shape you want and you'll have an interesting mark like i had some students get butterfly shapes and all kinds of things really anything flat will work so i think somebody asked about buttons you can use buttons as long as they're flat enough anything has an interesting shape and you have two of them that match and that are flat will work marie um somebody was uh hoping that uh, from the first three patterns to see how the star-like design is made. Let me see, are you referring to this yellow one? Um, I think it's, this person's uh, talking about the first three patterns. So this was the second three patterns. Here with these like odd shapes here. It's, um, it's I'm assuming so. If you're talking about these sort of abstract star-like shapes, it's really just how the fabric fell in the fold. It had a kind of a crisp angle to it. So but you, you notice that they're all really different. I think that would also happen more if you had a heavier fabric like canvas that doesn't buckle and bend as easily. So the stiffer your fabric, um, you're going to get a little more angular effect. Whereas the softer fabric you have, you'll get a more round effect. I hope that answers that question. Okay, so we've talked about it's a GMA. And the next one is to do some sewing effects. So Nui um, is going to be talking about anything that is sewn with a needle. And you can create some different looks depending on how you sew the fabric. So Orinui is like the top left picture. In that one, you fold the fabric and then you stitch a running stitch close to the fold. And it creates these sort of dental x-ray kind of looks. They look goofy to me, like wisdom teeth. You sew along the fold and then gather the fabric tightly. Maki Nui is a chevron effect. In this one, you fold the fabric and then sew a whip stitch over the edge. And that diagonal stitch that goes over the edge creates those V shapes. As you stitch, you try to pull tightly along, gathering the fabric up. And the bottom one is Mokume Shibori, and this is a wood grain effect. For this one, you stitch parallel full rows of running stitch across either an unfolded or folded fabric. And you leave a knot on one end and a tail on the other. So each line has a knot on one end and a tail on the other. When you're done going over the whole thing, you gather all the tails together, gather up all the folds very tightly, knot it off, and then it's ready to dye. So I have some, I have a needle already in this thread. And let me do all this. Okay. So whenever you add a fold in, you are creating mirror images happening. So I'm going to first do the toothy one. I could maximize my sewing time by like, say I want to have 
several rows of the toothy look. I could fold my fabric up. I don't know if I'll get another one in there now. Just those two. And I could stitch through two rows and it'll have more compression and I'll get some mirroring effect and I will have to do half the sewing. So I'm always looking for easy things to do. I've already threaded a needle and this does work better with a longer needle that you can load a lot of stitches on. And I want a good knot at the end. When I'm knotting, I cross my needle and thread over each other and then wind the needle, hold on to the windings and pull through. That makes a nice big knot at the end. So I'm gonna have my folds ready. You can press your folds into your fabric before you start sewing so that you have a lot of precision. And now I'm just going to do a running stitch. So I poke down and then bend up and poke up. So I'm sort of folding and loading a bunch of stitches onto the needle. This is why having a longer needle is helpful. This is gonna create that toothy effect. Now you can have some fun and create shapes by changing where that line goes. Like I was stitching very close to the top edge about a quarter of an inch away, and that would just create a straight line. I could stitch down and create some curves and do some interesting things. Gotta slide that off, pull through. I'm not really worried yet about um, compression. You can compress at the end. And now I think I'll add a little curve in here. So I'm gonna just stitch a curve. You could sketch out a design onto your fabric with um, a washable marker or pencil and follow the lines that you draw. So you could create kind of a line drawing on the fabric using this technique. And if you look behind me, can you make my face highlighted? Sure. As you can see this one, it has all these like loops that go down through the fabric. That's how I did this. So I just folded along where I want, wanted the loop to go and then stitched this running stitch through those folds. So you can really draw with this technique on the fabric. It could be very abstract, just finding folds and stitching them wherever you want them to be, or you can very carefully plan out where you want those lines to go. Okay, so let me, I'm very close to the end here, so I'm gonna quickly, you can go back to my hands if you haven't already. Um, I'm just gonna quickly get this stitched across. Those long needles are so good. You could get a ton all on the needle all at once and then pull through. So I don't know if it's easy to see with the white thread I was using this time, but you can see I've got a line, a curve, and then back to a line. So in the middle of the fabric, I should get two semicircles. Now, the stitching by itself isn't enough. Like if I just dyed this, it wouldn't really do anything. The important part is to gather it up and have compression. So I have a nice strong knot at the end and I'm just gonna gather this up, slide it down as tightly as I can without snapping. If you're using sewing thread, you may want to double it. Um, quilting thread is really good. And I'm using this crochet cotton. If you have a fine fabric, but you're using a big thread or a big needle, you can end up with like needle holes when you do this, but it's just part of the aesthetic, I think. All right, that's all gathered up and ready for the dye pot. And that was the, uh, which one was it? I haven't done this in a while. I'm forgetting all these names. Ori Nui. Or anyway. Now we'll do the Makinui, which is the chevron effect. It looks like this top right one. Similar effect, you're gonna start with a fold. And again, you can use this folding to draw on the fabric. Like I can make this line go wherever I wanted to.
and you want a nice strong knot at the end. So I'm gonna knot that up a few times to bring it through. This time, instead of a running stitch that goes up and down and up and down through that fold, I wanna do a whip stitch. So I'm gonna go down and then twist around the edge of the fabric and then go down. So I'm always going down, I twist around. I'm kind of wrapping the needle around the edge of that fabric. As I wrap, I'm gonna kind of slide them off, but I don't wanna pull through. I just wanna keep going around, around, around. When I run out of room, just slide them off a little bit, but don't pull through. A little fiddly. I also have kind of a thick fabric and I've got a big needle. They do have special th um, thimbles. They're leather and they like sit at the bottom of your thumb, your finger, so that you can kind of push with that part of your thumb when you're doing this particular technique. Because you kind of want to have something to press against the bottom of the needle as you're going through. It'll be a little easier on your fingers. Um, there we go, sliding it off. All right, I'm gonna take some big jumps to the end, I think. This is another one where depending on how deep you go into the fabric, those Vs would be longer or shorter. And it's already pretty tight, but I want to go through and pull that as tight as I can. Oh, I snapped it. Don't snap it. Oh, always when you're doing a demo. All right, since that happened, I know maybe I pulled too hard. Maybe it needs to be a double thread if your thread's not strong enough. So you can double a thread and try it and see if that makes a difference. So I'm just going to do a few just so I have a look later. Do it a little bigger this time. And slide it up. Okay. And then after you've compressed it and it's nice and tight, you can give a little extra stitch in the end to make a knot and pull it tight. All right. So I have a little section there that would be the maquinui. While I'm here, I'm going to start some of the wood grain. So I'm gonna sew a row. And I'm doing this through the folded fabric. So I'll get a mirrored effect. When you're doing this particular one, you don't wanna pull through right away because you wanna be able to line up all your stitches. So I would Keep that flat for now, and then start a new thread. And since I snapped earlier, I think I want to double it just to make sure that I don't snap it when I pull. Make a nice knot at the end and just sew another parallel line. So depending on how close together the lines are on the wood grain, you'll get some different effects, whether they're far apart or close together. Because how you wrinkle it up, you'll get um, these different shaped wrinkles. I'm doing very random and large stitches. They could be more regular. Depends on whether you want a straighter wood grain effect or you want a more random ripply wood grain effect. In um, Japan, when they do this, they'll often print a series of 
water soluble um, ink dots on the fabric that you can follow. So you could go along with a marking pen or a ruler and line out dots to stitch on. Or you could try this on a polka dot fabric. See what happens. Give some tails and then do another row. And then when you're all done, you would gather them all up together very tightly. It's nice, like I said, stitching through this um, doubled fabric. It maximizes your time. It creates a mirrored effect. You don't have to do as much stitching. Okay, so I've got three rows, which is probably all I'm gonna get through tonight. So I also wanna show you how to dye this stuff. All right, so I've got my three rows. Last step is gather them all together, find all the ends, hold on to them, and then gather the fabric up. When I was a little girl, my mom taught smocking, which anybody's familiar with, you know, it's like the stitching embroidery you do on a gathered fabric. And I don't know where her smocking machine is. I wish I had it because the smocking machine, if you've got one, would be so great for preparing this mokume kind of style wood grain. So again, keeping it tight, gathering it all up tightly into that little bundle. And then you would just knot them all together at the end. Keep it hot. So there's Mokume. The last one I want to do is Arashi. I don't have a full pull here. I'm going to do a little mini version. Um, depending on how much fabric you have and what size pole you have, you can get some different effects. Arashi um, comes from the word for rainfall, and it looks like rain on the fabric or like ripples of water. Uh, it does help to have a wet, damp fabric. You're gonna wrap the fabric, either folded or unfolded, onto a pole. And then you're gonna wrap around it with some thread, spiraling up the pole. You're the top end, and then compress all of the fabric down to one end. You wet hands on it. Yeah. So oh, I just wet this fabric, it's nice and damp. And I have a little plastic um, flagpole that I'm gonna use. I could try some different things here. If I just wound this whole thing on to the, the pole, if I started at one end and then rolled onto the other end, I would create an ombre effect. So it'd be light at the beginning end and dark at the other end. You can change the direction of your wrapping so I could roll on the diagonal, get a different effect. I can introduce a fold. And wherever the fold is, I would end up with some diagonal marks instead. You can also, if you have a lot of fabric and a small pole, you can roll and wrap on and then scrunch it down and then roll some more and wrap on. I think I'm going to do this in four because I don't have a lot of space. Try that. Well, maybe I'll ombre from the corner. So I'm going to roll this on tightly. Not tightly, just normal. And now it's all rolled on to my pole. And then with this thread again, I'm going to start at the end and wrap on. If you wind up in one direction, you're going to get more diagonal lines. If you wind up and then down again, you'll get crisscrossing lines. So I could go back down again or I could secure this. I think I'm just going to secure it. And cut this and then just tuck it under. So that is pretty tight, but 
we really want to scrunch it down. So it's this compression, pushing everything down to the bottom. And it's nice that I've got that little flagpole end there that's going to hold that on. It wants to release, so I could maybe put like a clamp or something here to make sure it doesn't want to slide back up. But that's just because it's a really a lot of very skinny pole and a lot of wrapping. But that isn't moving too much. So it's that compression that's going to make the technique look really cool. So I've got all of my different examples ready to dye, and I want to share some directions on using the dye. My mouse pad got a little wet and not wanting to work. There we go. Whenever you're working with dyes, always put gloves on and protect your area. I'm also wearing um, an apron. Uh, if you have one of those aprons that's like for paper making that um, it's not going to soak through, that's even better. I'm going to use Proshan MX dye. And usually what I do is I put two teaspoons of dye per yard of fabric I'm using in whatever, however you're dyeing. You can put uh, about a gallon or two of water into a big bucket that you have like total immersion and your fabric's nice and loose. Um, but since we're talking about compression, we can do low immersion dyeing. So I'm going to put my dye, two spoons, teaspoons of dye, into about a 12 ounce bottle of water um, so it's really concentrated. Then um, I'm going to put my dampened fabrics into a jar drizzle the dye over top of it, and then um, let it soak for a few moments, about 10 minutes, and then pour soda ash on top of it to activate the dye. So what happens is the soda ash creates an alkali environment, which helps open up the fabrics, the fibers, and allows the dye particles to bond with the fiber um, so it's a more permanent kind of dye. Um, where was I? Oh, we're going to wet our fabric before dyeing, and then squeeze out any excess, and then place everything in a container, drizzle the dye over. You can drizzle multiple colors at once for a multicolor effect. Let it soak for about 10 minutes, and then pour on the soda ash. And then you need a minimum of an hour to let it batch, but I've left these, I've left these a week long. <laughs> the longer you leave it, the more dye kind of bonds to the fabric um, and then wash out. Um, you don't spend as much time on wash out if you leave it a little longer. So um, if I were to wash it out right away, I'd have a lot more dye washing out of the fabric. Whereas if I leave this overnight and then wash out tomorrow, not as much dye is going to come out. So you'll get some darker colors, some brighter colors if you leave it longer. Okay, so let me go back. And since I'm going to use dye, I want to put my gloves on. Nice to have longer gloves, like dishwashing gloves, so it'll stretch up your elbows a little bit. I like to save old containers. So I've got some big glass containers that will hold my fabrics in them. I have prepared some dye in a 12 ounce bottle. So I put two teaspoons of dye into this bottle. Actually what I did is I filled the bottle up with water, poured it into a bucket, a little bucket that was more open, measured my dye into it, mixed it up in the bucket and then poured it back in the jar so that I would make sure that everything was um, mixed in and I didn't have any dry particles. The, the dye powder is a little bit hydrophobic. It doesn't really like to mix in well. So if you were doing a big vat of dye instead, you would want to mix your dye in a small container before putting it into your big bucket. Got my dye. I have small container of some soda ash. I have some warm water in a little measuring container. 
with something to mix with. In my pocket, I've got some measuring spoons. And I think I'm ready to go. So um, I might be able to squeeze all these into one jar. So I'm going, these were dry. So I'm going to dampen these. I've got a bucket of water. Marie, could you tell us what soda ash is again and what it does? So chemically, it's similar to bicarbonate. It's um, the chemical that creates an alkali environment. So sort of, sort of like baking soda, but it's like it's like a what you call it, electron or proton or something off from your baking soda. Um, and uh, it's just, it's the chemical that creates the alkaline environment that makes, it's like the glue for the dye. I've dampened these, so I'm just gonna dump them into a jar. So it's one. basically the stuff that helps the dye to, to stick to the fabric? Exactly, like the glue. I do not know, and I'm sorry, I do not know the chemical equation. I am not a chemist. I just trust that it works. And it does. If you don't use soda ash with the fiber reactive dye, the reaction doesn't happen. It just ends up being like a stain. I had already dampened my itajime pieces. So I'm just going to pop them in. Actually, I might pop them in a little bit later. So I've got my dye here. And I'm just going to drizzle it on. And I've done this with sorry where do you where do you get soda ash so wherever you can buy fiber reactive dye so this one i got from dharma fiber reactive dye so they they will ask you if you buy fiber reactive dye on dharma before you actually pay for it they'll ask you did you buy soda ash so if you're getting nice. proton mx or the dharma you want to make sure you get some soda ash with it so i'm just drizzling this in it's like a nice little stream i could use my spatula and just like move them around and make sure i got all the sides and drizzle this on this effect especially if you're trying to do multi colors is great because the dye really only goes where you want it to go i've done this with kids in a big classroom where we used those big salad containers like, you know, the clamshell salad containers, and we would like bind up their shirts, stick it into the clamshell, and they have like primary colors of the dye in these jars. And they would just go to town, putting colors all over, and end up with amazing rainbow pieces. So I wonder if they really these. enjoyed that. What? I said, I bet those kids really enjoyed that. Oh, it was the best art day. All right, so I'm just checking and making sure I got in everywhere. Got still some white spots. I'm gonna whistle a little more. So the benefit to doing it this way is that you don't waste so much water. You know, it's one of the big problems in the textile industry is how much water is wasted all the time um, and pollutes the environment. So the, the less water you use, and dying processes, better you're being to the environment. Oh, thank you, Ms. Ann Thoday. She says, hardware stores and pools had no idea. Never gone looking for those kinds of chemicals. So it's just nice with these like nozzles, you can really soak in and get little in those holes. I was going to do multicolors, and I'm sorry, but once upon a time, I did this at Fleischer, and I brought all of my other bottles to Fleischer, and I thought they were here, and they're not. I didn't have any other bottles to do this with for today. Sorry. Trust me, you can do multicolors and have some really cool effects with different color bottles. So I just soaked that in. It's all in there, in my jar. I think I'm going to be able to fit them all. Now this is fun. You could get like stripes because you can drizzle on just a little section of one color. 
And then on the other side, which was a little different color, I could leave some of these areas blank and get some striping effects. Maybe I'll try that. I'm just going to leave it as is. So part of the reason why this works is I've got a higher concentration of dye than you would normally have. So it's, it's pretty well concentrated in there. So it's carrying quite a lot of dye into that fabric. I would want to let this sit for about 10 minutes. We don't really have. So just so you know, that would sit. I've got my little bucket of water here. That paper towel go. Got dye on my measuring cup. And my soda ash here. I have a really large container, that's why I brought it off. And this is also something that doesn't really like to go in, but I'm just gonna sprinkle and stir because it, it is hard to get it to dilute. It wants to settle to the bottom. And what's the ratio are you using of soda ash to water? So this is um, about a, a liter of water and I'm doing two tablespoons. It's more, it's more about the ratio of like dye and the chemicals to the fabric though. I could put less in and it would be fine because I don't have a full yard of fabric in there. So you two tablespoons. Per yard? Yeah, it's really for per yard. So like when I'm teaching a class and there's like a whole bunch of people with their jars ready, I just make up a big solution like this and then pour some into everybody's jar like that. Um, if you were doing a vat, if I had a yard of fabric, I would use this. So usually I'm using for about a yard of fabric, two teaspoons of dye in my container and two tablespoons of soda ash. All right, so that's all mixed up. Pretend this sat for 10 minutes and I would just pour this in. This doesn't have to be totally filled, but I do want it to cover the fabric. And you know, it's amazing how much fabric you can squeeze into a, a pint jar. You probably do a whole t-shirt like this. Okay. Um, ideally, I would put the cap on. Um, because I have these things sticking out, I can't really do that right now. So what I would want to do is cover this with some plastic wrap to prevent evaporation. So part of low immersion dyeing is you want to keep it wet as long as you can. Um, this is a full jar, so it's probably not going to evaporate that much anyway. But as I left it for my four hours or overnight, I would just cover the jar. That would also help me from tipping it over and messing everything up in my studio. So um, that is our little presentation of all of these different folding and sewing and wrapping techniques. Um, if you want to switch back to my face, so I can see people see me again. That would be nice. Um, and what I'm going to do is when, when I'm finished washing these out, uh, I'll post them on my Instagram. So if you follow Instagram, it's my full name, Marie Elchin, M-A-R-E-E-L-C-I-N. And you can see how they turned out on my Instagram. I'll also um, hashtag Fleischer Community. So pop up on there. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Marie. And if you send those images to me, I can just email everybody directly oh, yeah, uh, as well. So. Everybody sure. who participated. Yeah. And I just shared your Instagram. I hope I spelled everything correctly. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So um, just the last step on this would be to let it sit for about, I'm going to let it sit overnight actually, and then I'll wash it out tomorrow morning. You just want to wash it until the water runs clear. You can use Synthropol, which is a special detergent for dyeing if you want things to um, not like buy in spaces you want to. Usually I'll rinse them pretty well, then I will unravel unravel them and then give them another good rinse or throw them in my washer by themselves. Awesome. Hi. Marie, this was so great and we did so many different varieties of techniques. It was amazing. Thank yeah. you so much and thank you everybody for joining us again. Um, do join us again this Thursday. 
Uh, and we also have a new series of uh, uh, webinars coming out. Um, they are about art and social activism and social change. And our uh, wonderful um, exhibitions manager is the moderator and programmer for those. His name is Gerard Silva. So watch out for that tomorrow. Um, it's a great one with a, an amazing uh, printmaker, Katie Kaplan. Um, so yeah, thank you. Unless there's other questions. Oh, can we get the copy of the slides possibly, Marie? Yeah, I can send that to you so you can send out to everybody with the pictures. Yep, yeah. I will do that. So look out for that email from me, you guys. And thank you so much. Have a great night. Stay safe, everybody. And see you again soon. Thanks, Marie. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have fun.